Yes, good morning, good morning. So it is my privilege to serve Tulane as its Chief Academic Officer, Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to day two of the New Orleans Book Fest at Tulane University. It's a highlight of the year. I'm really uh, privileged to have this chance to welcome you all, especially those of you for whom this may be your first visit to our campus. I hope you find yourselves uh, feeling at home and come back often. And there is no better way to start day two of this festival than with a conversation among three of our beloved Tulane faculty members uh, on a, about the history of our extraordinary city. So I want to introduce the panelists for our conversation on New Orleans a history, starting over here on the left, Richard Campanella. Uh, is a geographer and associate dean for research at Tulane School of Architecture. He's written numerous books about New Orleans and hundreds of articles on Louisiana history and geography. His most recent book, Draining New Orleans, a 300-year quest to dewater the Crescent City, <clears throat> recounts the daunting challenges involved in reclaiming New Orleans swamps and marshes and installing subsurface drainage systems. Then T.R. Johnson is professor of English and vice presidential fellow at Tulane University. He's the author of New Orleans, a writer's city and editor of New Orleans, a literary history. He's also written books about psychoanalysis, teaching and pro style for over 20 years. He's lived in the ninth ward of New Orleans and hosted a contemporary jazz radio program at WWOZ 90.7 FM. And we are uh, honored that today's book festival conversation will be moderated by Larry Powell. Uh, professor Emeritus of History at Tulane University and author of the acclaimed book on the founding of New Orleans, The Accidental City. And I'm sure you'll enjoy the conversation. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to our guests. Thank you, Provost Foreman. Uh, it saved me the uh, uh, having to introduce the, the guests, but I do want to say one thing about Rich. Uh, uh, you know, he's already, in, he already has in, in the works another book, uh, and he's starting to spread his wings. It's called Sighting Stories Explaining the Locations of Louisiana Cities, Towns, and Villages. It's very hard to keep up with you, Rich. <laughs> uh, when Cheryl Landrieu asked me to moderate this, uh, this session, New Orleans History, a conversation, the first thing that jumped to my mind, given the fact that one of our panelists is a celebrated uh, geologist, and the other is a distinguished literary professor of Tulane, I wanted to know, first of all, what does geology have to do with it? What is, that is, what does it have to do with history? And I think from reading Rich's stuff, pretty much everything. <laughs> I mean, geology here seems to have marched in, in lockstep with historical time. I mean, this land was probably not even here in the, four, in the 15th century, right? The beginning of the 15th So, it's, so Christopher Columbus' grandparents were probably in courtship at the time. And we know about the Batur. I'm not sure people realize that the, the area where uh, the warehouse district is and the port was the river. It's, uh, and it was really actually built between 1780 and 1880. It was in the water, in the channel of the river, in t as late as about 1805. Okay. The entire warehouse. Did. So this is, a, this is a city built of dynamic sedimentation that you should do. So that's one, one question that I, I wanted to put out there. And the other is one that I've been puzzling with for as long as I've lived here, which is 45 years. Uh, and that is, how do you account for the fact that New Orleans, almost uniquely, has been the home for so many creatives, both homegrown and transplants, uh, and a place where, especially if people from the South like to expatriate to without having to go to Paris. Uh, and I was puzzling about this, and after reading TR's very splendid book, uh, it's left me, uh, my bafflement runneth over because it's much deeper and more broader than I had imagined. And the third question is, and is uh, what is it about New Orleans that spurred each of you, a geographer and a literary professor, to take a, such a sharp turn into history? Hmm. I mean, I'm wondering if you were living, if, say if you had ended up teaching at Cleveland, right. <laughs> or Atlanta, mm -hmm. or even Chicago or New York, I mean, would you have made these deep dives and detours into history, and you both do a splendid job of it? I mean, 
maybe New York, but no one person can wrap his arms around it. But this, this is kind of a vest pocket city of, uh, really a cosmopolitan city as yeah. much of it is a, a provincial one. And I right. think you're, right. both of your works you know, I, there's a phrase uh, I, I hit upon a while back that uh, New Orleans historically is a kind of frontier capital, which is very paradoxical. Obviously, the capital and the frontier are usually far, far, far away from each other. But New Orleans was kind of both. It was way out here in the middle of nowhere, as it were, for a long time. Obviously, the river is a crucial kind of anchoring uh, presence, but, but a frontier capital, which enabled... Uh, endless possibilities for self-invention, self-fashioning, um, no background checks, you know, way out here back in the day. And so people could kind of put on an identity and develop an identity here uh, in a way that was an incitement to creativity and courage and um, that naturally becomes a kind of a, a deep foundation, I suppose, to as you put it, the, it's a magnet for creatives. It's always been a place of self-invention and self-fashioning, um, you know, particularly for the European descended settlers and, and Creoles in a way. Uh, and, that, and I think that laid a kind of groundwork for the imagination and a kind of performativity uh, and a kind of just baked in creativity and improvisation um, that uh, this place requires given its weather patterns and, and landscape. Um, and that, that I think is, is sort of a, the beginning of how I would answer why this place is such an incredible magnet for creatives. It's a frontier capital. As you say, it's kind of Paris at, at one level, but it's also way out in the backwoods in another sense. And that, that paradox uh, is a great spur to the imagination and to the kind of fostering of communities of artists, the you know, successions of of bohemian communities that have flourished through the generations, most pointedly in the French Quarter, and now downriver a little bit as well. The geographical foreword to all that, uh, that I would point to in explaining this uh, exceptionality is the fact that you could think of this city as a nexus of a unusually oriented foreland and a uniquely enormous, capacious, uh, hinterland that proved to be the wealthiest valley on earth. If you think of all the other American ports on the eastern seaboard and the west, they were mostly seaports. Yes, they were also river ports, but the rivers only had a hinterland. I mean, New York City, you go up to the Adirondacks, right? You're in uh, Charleston, or, or uh, you're, you're only able to go up to the foothills of the Appal Appalachians. Mobile, you could go into central Alabama. Here, you could go all the way practically to the foothills of the Rockies. Uh, and so, uh, the, by the way, the foreland is every, everything seaside of the port that you, that you interact with commercially or demographically. The hinterland is everything upriver and behind. So the orientation of our foreland was not deep draft harbors looking straight uh, uh, eastward to European and, and uh, cities of the Eastern Hemisphere, but rather into the Southern Seas, into the Gulf, the Caribbean, the South Atlantic Basin, that, that Latin, Afro-Caribbean, Mediterranean world, as well as the, uh, the, everything that could come through the Atlantic and later the Pacific. So that, that spatial nexus gave the city uh, access to such a wider range of people's cultures and influences uh, and to come full circle with this, and I think the inspiration for all three of us and most of the people in this room is that we have such a phenomenal inventory of historical houses and cityscapes and live oaks that bring the past uh, into the present. You know, uh, of course this is a seaport on a river, isn't it? I mean, this is where the river meets the sea for purposes of commerce, but it's 100 miles from the sea. Uh, and if you recall, just a few months ago, that sea was, was trickling coming, up yeah. the bottom of the river. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Rich, uh, I mean, can you imagine you're doing such a deep dive into the history of Cleveland if you were at Case Western University? I, I have a hunch that there are just as many fascinating historical, geographical, and cultural stories about Cleveland, yes. You do. I think you might have to work harder, though. <laughs> um, you dig, could, here well, you wouldn't have to dig. You would have to dig deeper. Yeah. You, you, you would. Uh, you, you, I, I, I think each each space and place has to be held to its its own story. I, I don't think we necessarily have to compare them to um, a particularly exceptional. Case. Well, I mean, in your new book, you know, uh, draining New Orleans. Uh, even the engineers can be hucksters. 
I mean, George Broad. I mean, you could yes. tell that story because that's an interesting. Yeah, um, it, the, the, the book that we're talking about, Draining New Orleans, uh, is, is about, just like the subtitle says, a full 300 years of the effort to remove water for the landscape, from the landscape here. So this uh, starts with reclamation, which is the removing of standing water, the back swamp, uh, and uh, could also mean the turning of open water into land, the batcher, the warehouse district, the lakefront. But then it means the installation of subsurface drainage. And to address your question, what I learned in researching this book is that for the first 200 years, not the last 100, for the first 200 years, this story was surprisingly biographical. Mm. These were high profile um, engineers and surveyors and architects at a time when men, those professions almost blurred lines and they described themselves as all of the above. Right, right. They were well known in the community. Uh, they were um, admired across the boards. They were almost household names to the point that one of the key figures in the book was literally known as the drainage king. Uh, and a special parade was held for him the Saturday before Mardi Gras in 1915 down St. Charles Avenue, uh, down Canal Street. They got on a vessel. They went uh, down the Harvey Canal to this brand new pump station that had Baldwin Woods new pumps in them. And this guy, George Hero, had come up with this whole strategy uh, to dewater the back swamp and, uh, of, the, of the West Bank. And this being New Orleans, he did it with style. And who do you think pressed the button uh, to dewater, to activate the pumps? Woodrow Wilson in the Oval Office of the White House. They had a telephonic connection. And the button was pressed. Now, it turned out there was a delay, and Woodrow Wilson wandered off to play golf links, and some <laughs> unremembered aide in the White House drained the back swamp of the West Bank. In three hours, the water went, went down. Do you know his name? Do you know his name? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and isn't it the case, Rich, too? That was 1915, I think you said, which only a, roughly six months later was one of the biggest, most important hurricanes the city ever endured. It utterly changed the city. Exactly. And so the dewatering occasion, the real estate development of those very back swamps, which thence, this is a major part of the story, start to drop below sea level, thus becoming more vulnerable. The 1915 storm evidenced that, and one of the responses for that was the reclamation of the lakefront to build up this high ground as this uh, barrier. And T.R., you know, I, this book of yours is really kind of astonishing what you Thank have you. uncovered. Thank you. Uh, it's organized geographically, but in corridors of streets, Esplanade, St. Charles Avenue, Royal Street, and they all have greater or larger catch basins of, mm -hmm. of weirdness and creativity. Right. And, uh, and I was just gobsmacked at some of what I had learned. I mean, I thought I knew a lot, but I just realized I knew very little. Oh. And, about, and about Esplanade, that mm -hmm. was the, maybe that was the biggest eye-opener of all. Interesting. You know, that was one of the toughest chapters to write because I, as I got into it, you know, I had finished Royal Street, the Royal Street Quarter, which was my way of sort of organizing the French Quarter. And that was the first one I did, and it was challenging. But I thought, okay, I've got the French Quarter handled. The rest of this will be relatively easy. Then I got into Esplanade, and Esplanade was a bear. There is so much to talk about with Esplanade. Um, it is, it, it has a fascinating history. It was, you know, kind of the original pathway, the, the original highway, literally highway the through the swamps into the city from Bayou St. John into the old city. And, and so its, its significance in literary writing and in ambitious writing of various kinds goes way back and it stays thick and, very, and, and also quite various. And even today it's a fundamental, you know, kind of nexus of major literary activity um, along Bayou St. John, along Esplanade, and it has been that the whole way. And I'm thinking of things like you know, Kate Chopin's The Awakening is set on Esplanade. Yeah, that's, 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 you know, Solomon North was 12 years a slave. He's, in a, he's trafficked through a slave pen right there at Esplanade and Charters. John Dos Passos wrote a big chunk of his major modernist trilogy and masterpiece, the USA Trilogy, right there at Esplanade. Which I've been, been reading. I was, is that right? Yeah. And I was astonished to learn that. Yeah, Esplanade and, and, and Decatur is right where he was. And that's just to hit a few... When you think about the musical legacies of Esplanade, you know, we often think about Basin Street, the Treme, uh, Central City, obviously of crucial significance. But, you know, when you think about Esplanade Avenue and the 7th Ward in particular, 
That's Sidney Bechet, Jelly Roll Morton, figures whose memoirs alone are astonishing literary achievements. And, and then jump to the modern generation, Frank Ocean, you know, um, and Manny Fresh. So in the hip hop and modern R&B era, giants of that world are, are of, that, of that corridor, as does Jelly Roll Morton and Sidney Bechet. Uh, Alan Toussaint lived kind of out by the bayou uh, along in the Seventh Ward. And, uh, you know, so it's just, it's, it's so thick. Uh, you know, Gottschalk was born on Esplanade. I mean, it's just, it, when Tyler I- Tyler Perry. What's that? Tyler Perry. Hey, of course, Tyler Perry. The, the, wel the single wealthiest writer, as far as we can tell, in the history of the world. Nobody has made more money by writing than Tyler Perry. And he grew up in the Seventh Ward. And wow. to this day is a, he's a billionaire. How many people become billionaires writing, you know, stories? He did. And he is a, a and this is, this is the seventh word. The riches are, st and the more I dug into it, the more kind of unwieldy it became. And so I began to break it into periods and neighborhoods to, to kind of contain it. But um, it is, uh, Esplanade alone it has, is, a, is a kind of cultural corridor of, of staggering complexity and depth and wealth that um, has few parallels, it seems to me, in the United States. I start the book talking about Royal Street as this fundamental sort of artery of the American literary imagination. And it is, but uh, one of the things I learned in working on this book is that Esplanade is, is, a, is a very big deal too. Well, it did surprise me quite a bit. Um, talk about Bob Kaufman. This, oh, was, this yeah. was a huge a, revelation to me. An astonishing figure. Bob Kaufman is not widely known in New Orleans today. There's no historical marker or plaque or anything. He grew up in the Seventh Ward, uh, right between Esplanade and St. Bart, St. Bernard Avenue, born in 1925. And he left here right after high school to join the Merchant Marine and never really came back. He's got siblings that still live in that neighborhood. Bob Kaufman became a central figure of the beatnik movement. He is largely credited with coining the term beatnik. He is such an amazing figure. In San Francisco, there is a street named Bob Kaufman Alley. Um, in Paris, he is known as the Black Rimbaud. He is a surrealist uh, in the Bay Area who, as the beatnik movement kind of gave way to the psychedelic area of the 60s in that part of the world, he became a kind of giant. And very significantly, in the late 50s, he got into, uh, he became targeted by the police. Uh, he was African-American, Afro-Creole, we would say here, I think, but um, he had a lot of white fans and a white girlfriend. Well, the police got very interested in him. This is 58, 59. He was arrested something like 35, 40 times in 18 months it was and beaten, and it was horrible. Uh, he finally left the Bay Area, goes to New York, and um, stops writing and kind of slows down for a while. When the Kennedy assassination happens, he was so, um, so affected by this event that he took a vow of silence, and according to legend, he did not utter a single word out loud until the end of the Vietnam War, like 12 years later. So he goes silent in November of 63. He, he wrote and wrote and wrote, but did not speak from basically Thanksgiving of 63 until May of 75. An astounding thing. Poor, you know, putting out lots of writing in this time, but wouldn't speak. Um, it's an incredible life. A, he is a legend of San Francisco, and it seems to me that a whole lot of what he's about aesthetically is, is shaped by carnival. There's a surrealism and a whimsy, a do what you wanna in his aesthetic that is breathtaking on the page and that became the stuff of legend uh, in his time. But here in New Orleans, we, we've largely forgotten him. And I, part of what I wanted to do in this book is really shine a light on some very important people that are very heavily New Orleans affiliated, but are not necessarily a big topic of conversation here. You know, uh, So that Bob Kaufman leads off my chapter on Esplanade. You know, the other thing I got from your book, there was a, I forget his name, a visiting writer. And he, he had a real sense of the uh, uh, fragility of this land. He looked out, he could see that this is a land that could be disappearing, and that's yeah. why I think geography is yeah. part of yeah. even the creative sensibility mm -hmm. uh, of folks here. Even they may not write about it, but there's a sense mm -hmm. that 
you know, we don't really have solid footing here. I think you're thinking of Jeff, uh, Jeff Dyer, a brilliant contemporary yeah, British essayist. Was, yeah. And he was marveling at the fact he had an apartment on Esplanade, and he suddenly, looking at old maps and, and so on, and kind of locate him where he was, realized that the apartment that he was living in was now several feet farther from the river than it was when it was built. And this became for him a metaphor for the incredibly volatile and kind of uh, in process nature of life here, that it's a, a kind of improviser's capital because everything is moving all the time, even the land. My, my apartment is five feet farther from the river than it was when it was built. And of course, because of dewatering, what has happened? <laughs> I'm still thinking about that 12 year silent period. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Rich, you know, you wrote about Lincoln coming down here in the slave pens. I mean, would this have, would you have gone off to write a book, maybe not about that, but a subject say in Cleveland or Atlanta that would have given you? <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I really, I find this hard to believe. He came down from Indiana and then he came down from Illinois. <laughs> uh, well, to, to go back to the phenomena of the hinterland, um, the, uh, you know, Ohio and all these states, uh, they, uh, places like Rockport, why did Lincoln take his flatboat from Rockport, Indiana? Because in a cultural and economic sense, Rockport and New Orleans were closer together than Rockport and Pittsburgh. Well, uh, there you are, I mean, you're writing about Rockport. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, so I, I, I think, you know, the, the um, what, what one of the neat things about not just writing and studying the city, but by living here, is that you could live vicariously in other places. You go down to the river and the water you're seeing, at least some of it, uh, tumble down the great falls of the Yellowstone River and you're connected with the Rocky Mountains. The sediment is coming from those areas as well as the Ohio Basin. I always get a thrill in that first true cold front comes in in November or so. And uh, because that cold air is rolling off the Rockies and the, the Great Plains well into Canada, and as it's coming down here, it's having this, this interplay and this interface that I could see an analogy, once again, between hinterland and foreland with the tropically heated, warm air masses of the Gulf of Mexico. And so when I feel that cold front, once again, I vicariously connected to the North American interior. So also, you, th that you can't do in Cleveland. And, I, <laughs> and when I see that, I also think of downpours of a biblical... <laughs> Well, to come to draining, uh, no, one the of the, the many um, new challenges that we have, we're still getting roughly the same amount of annual lane, rainfall. It's about 65 to 68 inches per year. <clears throat> but we have empirical data showing that it's faller, falling in more intense and brief and more frequent periods. Uh, and that's where it's overwhelming the, the ability of the pumping system that we have. And that excess water stands on the cityscape, which, by the way, is where it stood before the cityscape was here. So every time you see that standing water on Claiborne, every couple of months we get one of these biblical downpours, that is the back swamp reminding us that the back swamp used to be there. <laughs> and will be again. Uh, T.R., one final uh, observation, and this is another astonishing discovery, revelation, about the colored waifs home. Oh, yeah. And as I understand it, it's still there. Mm -hmm. Is that where, where the restaurant in Roseland is? Exactly. The, as I understand the, 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 it, there the, was about six or eight sort of dorm, dormitory-like buildings. Tell them who the, the colored waifs home Oh, is the colored waifs home is where Louis Armstrong first raised a trumpet to his lips. Uh, and, you know, the the rest is history, as we say. And the, um, it was a place, he was, I guess, maybe 12 years old. Uh, there's a tradition, as many New Orleanians know, of firing a gun in the air at midnight on New Year's Eve. Well, as a 12 year old, he had a gun firing it in the air on New Year's Eve, was arrested and sent to the Colored Way Home at the far end of Esplanade, kind of behind Delgado uh, Community College. And the, uh, yeah, Roseland, the, the restaurant, is, is, is one of those six or eight dormitory buildings. It, I think uh, two of those buildings are still extant. One, I don't know what it is. The other one is now a restaurant. Armstrong was in there for a year or two. It was there that um, he got focused on music. Uh, he, they had a band, and at first he was not allowed in the band, but then he was allowed to sort of play a very secondary role in the band, and then very quickly he becomes the director and leader of the band. And they were allowed, this is very important, 
they were allowed to go out and do parades and walk all over the city playing their music. This is, you know, about 19, gosh, 1908, 1910, right around in there. Um, and it seems to me it was very, very significant. He was raised by his grandmother, who had been enslaved, a woman whose movements in life were very circumscribed around a very narrow channel, from the place where she slept to the kitchen where she cooked kind of thing for her life, um, maybe to the laundry, a very narrow circuit. Armstrong, as a, in his early teens, is walking all over the city making a big ruckus. You can begin to imagine psychologically what that began to feel like. And in his memoir, he says, uh, we were just, in a, it, you know, it was joy every step of the way. He eventually goes all over the world, Africa, Europe, the East, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it begins on these kind of um, marching trips with his trumpet outside of the Colored Ways home where he first got his hands on that trumpet. Does the Preservation Resource Center know about this? You know, th there is in that restaurant, they have signage of, of the band standing on the front porch with a little circle around okay. this little black right. guy's face. Um, and that's, that's, as far as I know, all that there is. You know, I'm supposed to open it up for questions with 10 minutes left. We have 15 minutes left in such a large crowd, maybe I should open it up now. And so, but I ask that you go to each of the microphones in the middle of the aisle, and if you, please try to keep your questions, uh, make them pointed, not too long, because there's a lot of, probably a lot of people have questions they'd like to ask. Hi, can I start? Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's very interesting to think of how uh, this uh, city is connected with all over the world, you know, and, and, and the, uh, all the rivers that come down and the cities and, and our consciousness of that and, and all the people that wrote about it. And yet I wonder how many people here know about uh, just two miles on the other side of the French Quarter that the Corps of Engineers plans to bring the river levels into the city, 12 blocks, and also demolish the, uh, the St. Claude Bridge, which is one of the uh, last uh, of the Strauss uh, heel trunnion bascal bridges in the country, even though there were a lot of them around and the, uh, the industrial canal lock, which was such, uh, is, is really a fantastic, significant right, uh, thing. Right. And yet, here in New Orleans, even right here, I think few people recognize what's happening in our own city. So it's the connection between the frontier and the capital right here in town. And I, I wonder if you'd comment on that. Rich, I think that's in your wheelhouse. Yeah. Well, it wasn't technically a, technically a question, <laughs> but he you want your... <laughs> but he... I, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, briefly say the, the reference is to the long debated widening of the uh, Industrial Canal. This was excavated between 1918 and 1923. Uh, ostensibly to connect river and lake, but mostly to create leasable wharf space where there was previously swamp and in the rear area, but uh, the Ninth Ward before it was Upper and Lower Ninth Ward. Uh, and uh, the lock was an engineering marvel that when it was installed, keep in mind roughly the same thing is going on on the West Bank in the form of the Harvey Canal. Um, what soon came to light was that uh, it was a bottleneck and uh, barges and tugs would line up, uh, you know, five and 10 waiting to go through as people in the city are trying to move back and forth. Um, and so <laughs> starting in the 50s, there were debates about how to resolve this. The West Bank uh, addressed it. I'm not gonna say solve the problem because they might have created another problem uh, very quickly. And you know what they did? They dug a new canal and that is the Algiers Canal, the Green Bridge going to, uh, to uh, uh, to English turn. Um, and uh, the East Bank, it was a lot more complicated because you have this very high density neighbor of the Ninth Ward. So we've basically been debating this for 70, one full human lifetime from the 1950s today. And as you can see, that de debate is ongoing. Okay, gentlemen here. With, with this being St. Patrick's Day weekend, I'm wondering what influence, if any, the Irish have had on the history of New Orleans. Well, I mean, pretty enormous, I think. <laughs> uh, they helped to uh, drag us out of the mud. They built the new Basin Canal. They were 
Um, I mean, there are two communities of Irish, there's the, the, the Silk Curtain Irish and the Potato Famine Irish, and those who uh, uh, came during the middle 19th century, I mean, they literally helped pull the city from the mud and did a lot of the dirty work. Right. And slave folks, because they, uh, they were valuable assets, some of that work was too dangerous for them to do, uh, just for that reason. And of course, they became, uh, you know, masterful politicians. I mean, they, they probably the ones who built the, the immigrant uh, machine, political machine, the old regulars that it used to be called. I mean, it's hard to imagine what New Orleans would be like had there not been Irish here. You could say the same, I think, for the, for the Italian and almost every other uh, ethnicity that has has come here, I mean, and, and including a lot of African ethnicities. We usually think people are just from Africa, but the ethnic, eth ethnic mix that made up the African American community here was, if anything, even more variegated than, than that's from U Europe. So, is that, does that answer your question? Yeah. You know, a quick addendum Anne Rice, a pure product of the Irish Channel. I would dare say that no single writer or culture bearer of any kind has done more to shape the world's perception of this place than right. And then she has sold more than 150 million copies of her books. They're in 80 different languages. I think out there in the world, when you say New Orleans, the first association is, oh, vampires, Anne Rice. Uh, and that's a pure, she is a pure product of the Irish Channel. The, by far, the two largest immigrant groups in the antebellum era, 1810s up to, uh, through the 1850s, were Irish and German. German yeah. So much so that when I tried to put all the other groups on a graph, I had to make extra space on the Y uh, axis to fit them in. Another contribution is probably, and there's a lot of research and controversy about this, but the Brooklyn-esque brogue here, if you map out where you have this Port City, Brogue, Boston, Brooklyn, a little bit in Charleston, New Orleans, they generally correlate to where there was large so Irish. This is where the Yad accent? Yes, yes. <laughs> I see the young man in the back. Hi, I'm Jack. I'm in seventh grade, and I go to a French immersion school here in New Orleans. And I'm wondering what got you guys into researching New Orleans? L L Larry, how about we start with you? You know, my hearing aid's not working really well. What, what was what, it? What got you interested in working on New Orleans? Oh, uh, gosh. You know, I came down here uh, from Yale in 78, and, uh, and they sprang something on me. They said they needed somebody to teach Louisiana history. <laughs> and this wasn't the entertainment I thought I'd been invited to. <laughs> and I didn't like it. And I said, you know, wait a minute. I'm, you know, I want to teach American history. And, and so I started teaching it, and I really, it really became interesting. And after about a year, I think I was good and truly hooked. Uh, I mean, there, I can't think of another city at which you can use as a springboard to write about so much, and you can, you can control it. The other, and quite frankly, the other explanation is if you live here for any amount of time, uh, and we're all transplants, by the way. Uh, you can de develop a kind of low-grade fever. <laughs> you know, and sometimes it rages out of control when you break your axle on one of our, our potholes. <laughs> but, you know, it's almost like Fallujah. Uh -huh. But other times when you're out, of, when you leave here, you wonder, gosh, I gotta get back, I miss it. I mean, I guess it's just partly existential, partly is was a random act of nature, literally. Stan uh, the man. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to... Great question, and I'd like to say a special hello to your middle school classmates in the back there. <laughs> and Rich? I, I, could, I could trace the moment to an exact uh, moment uh, when I became fascinated by the city. It was 53 years ago, true story, I was five. Uh, and my parents were helping me through a kitty reader on young Abraham Lincoln. And that's when I first learned that this young man took this long river down to this amazing city, and that stuck with me, and here I am. I love it. You know, similarly, I wasn't a little bitty kid, but I was an undergrad in college, uh, creative writing major, and the professor said, you need to read this novel. 
Robert Stone's A Hall of Mirrors. I was 20 years old, took it home, read it, was utterly spellbound by the vision of the city that he spun in the mid 60s, late 60s, of a very paranoid kind of film noir version of New Orleans. And then Hurricane Katrina, I've been living here about six years at the time, and it just galvanized my sense of the fragile uh, nature of this place, the kind of potential expiration date on it, and the urgency with which we need to understand it, document it, celebrate it, and disseminate knowledge about it, because someday it may not be here. It will live only on the printed page. So we've got to go all in in organizing our understanding of what, what's on the printed page. Stand the man. First of all, thank you guys for uh, doing this. And everyone in the room, especially those children back there, give yourselves a hand. Um, Walter, Walter and um, Ms. Landon have done a great job. So, Larry, the question for you is, when will we see a follow-up to Accidental City? Um, TR, for you, um, I'm glad you expounded on um, Bob Kaufman. There's a great film out on him right now on Canopy, uh, and when I die, I won't stay dead. And yeah. Dr. Saloy at Dillard yeah. has yeah. done a great job. Um, if you care to briefly speak to uh, the influence of Marcus Christian and to uh, Dr. Campanella, if you shoot him an email, he will respond back with this. I did. Morning. You never responded to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's in the works. <laughs> um, Stan asked me to speak to Marcus B. Christian's significance, and it's humongous. He was an African-American writer uh, who was living in real poverty, but managed, nonetheless, the 40s, 50s, 60s to produce an astounding body of work, corresponded with the leading lights of the Harlem Renaissance. All of this material is in an archive out at UNO. His, he was good friends with the grandparents of Brenda Marie Osby, who I think is commonly understood to be the greatest poet the city's ever produced. Uh, he also uh, became a kind of de facto mentor to Kalam Yassalam, and without whom the entire civil rights era and black power era in, in literature in this city would never, would not be the same. So as a kind of forerunner and precedent setter for Brenda Marie Osby and Kalam Yassalam, it's impossible to overstate the significance of Marcus B. Christian. And to do what he did in his situation in that era, it's, it's staggering testimony to his perseverance, his courage, his genius. Uh, uh, one final, one of his uh, contributions, which is also pretty huge, was the, uh, to the uh, WPA, uh, uh, what do you call the book? The, the writing the guide? Yeah, the, w, the, the WPA the guide, guide to New Orleans. Uh, yeah. But uh, gentleman here in the second um, microphone. Oh, there we go, okay. Um, talking about expat writers who presented New Orleans to the outside world. I don't know if anybody has a comment to make about Lafcadi O'Hearn and sort of the role that he played because his, his essays were amazing. Yeah. It, Im yeah, impossible to overstate the significance of Lafcadi O'Hearn in, in sort of defining uh, sort of the myth and legend of New Orleans. New Orleans as a symbol for the rest of America, which is to say the other to America. Instead of, you know, the hard charging efficiency and progress um, and moral seriousness uh, that we associate with the Upper East Coast. Lafcadio Hearn, in the aftermath of the Civil War, did these spectacular, gorgeously rendered portraits of the culture of the city that basically, um, to this day, he sort of set the menu, if you will, of the tourist industry in writing about haunted houses and swamps and dueling and all the things that we associate with the romance, the myth, the legend of New Orleans. He was the one that really put it together and delivered it to America in the 1870s and 1880s. Well, what about there. George Washington Cable? Oh, for sure, his contemporary, yeah. yeah. Right. Yes. Good morning, and Good morning. thanks again for being here. You talk about New Orleans and what it's like and what it took to establish it and keep it going, and uh, we have a lot of that going on now with politics and drainage and old infrastructure. Would you all care to comment on how we're going to continue to address that problem and what interesting literary comment might come out of that? 
uh, biggest issue in the city, the metropolis, and, and quite possibly the nation. Um, we used to be the best in the world in this, uh, and we allowed beautiful systems to go to rust. <coughs> uh, so specifically to your question, I'll, I'll look at drainage here. As you know, there's a new committee uh, assembled uh, looking at, at sewage and water board. Uh, there, are, there have been pl plenty of previous ones right after the August 5th flood in 2017 that did good work in taking stock and identifying spots. So I think one thing this committee needs to do is just kind of do a literature review of all the other documents that have come out because they're all pretty much saying the same thing. I think most people in the room know about uh, the limited pump capacity uh, and, uh, and our need, uh, which is on an 11 o'clock panel, by the way, to retain and store as much water on the landscape so that we don't rush too much water to canals and pumps and outfall canals that don't have the capacity to, to carry it. Um, if, if I were to point to um, a couple of things that probably uh, there seems to be a consensus. Uh, back in 1991, 33 years ago, there was a renewal vote on a millage uh, to provide a hard revenue stream to the Sewage and Water Board that was traceable all the way back to a very famous vote in 1899 by progressive forces in the city to provide exactly that. Uh, and overwhelmingly, people voted to tax themselves to pay for all this. It was up for renewal in 1941. 50 years later was 1991. And at that point, people voted against it and uh, the revenue street stream was not in place. And it was at that point that the Sewage and Water Board, to hear it tell, it had no other choice but to orphan off the storm drains and their connecting pipes over to the Department of Public Works. And that has been the entree problem to um, a significant uh, source of this flooding. So I'm wondering if this committee, uh, when tabled, you know, when assembled, would look at that first. And we have one last question. Yeah, thank you. Um, to what degree was Barataria Bay in the area around the feet an entry point for the Port of New Orleans in the earliest days of New Orleans? I don't think, I know it was a kind of haven for a illicit slave trade during the territorial period, the, the Baratarian. I mean, I think that if there was a back door, it would have been through the Rigolets and the lakes. Uh, but I think the, the Baratarian Bay was more for privateers and, uh, you know, the John Lafitte's and, it, it was a place to evade the port of New yeah, Orleans. That's the way you, where you evaded now, it, it, the customs. Late 1800s, early 1900s, there were all sorts of efforts to create seaways through the Barataria, uh, and, but that eventually became the MRGO on the east. Before we close, I'd like you to, we were discussing that metaphor for the audience, how it, it, the age. Yeah, uh, Larry and I were discussing uh, earlier here that uh, if you kind of read the room here, it's a little bit of um, uh, analogy to the topography and the urban development of New Orleans. Topographically, let's say the river is right behind us. You have the crest of the natural levee here, and you have the back slope where the city historically was, and then the low-lying back slope all the, all the way in the rear that was later. So this uh, is a natural levee, and that's the back of town. Correct, correct. And uh, if you kind of look across here, you'll see the the older part of the audience is also here, and the younger part is all the way those middle school students. Well, that's, that might be a hearing issue, too. Well, uh, please give a, a nice hand of applause for us. Today.